Much better. All right, good morning, everybody. We are doing a Maybach today. Typically, Maybachs have been brewed in the winter and lagered over through the winter, and then they pop out around springtime, uh, around May, hence the term Maybach. Instead of brewing in the late fall or the winter, we are brewing this Maybach in May, uh, which is counterintuitive, and uh, maybe probably can enjoy it June, July time frame. Before we get too deep in the video, I do want to just wish my best to you guys and your families uh, and those that you care about during this time. Uh, hopefully this provides some sort of distraction or encouragement during it. So thank you also to the healthcare workers out there. You guys already have a really hard job to start with and now you're doing even more of it. So we thank you for what you're doing. It's probably gonna be a longer video than usual. So uh, feel free to sit back and grab a couple beers and watch on. So Maybach is, uh, is an interesting beer and one that I didn't expect that I'd decide all of a sudden that I wanted to brew. Uh, but the seasonal beer thing is kind of getting to me and I've seen some Maybach around. So I kind of like figured I'd try it. Uh, so Maybach is basically a pale Bach. Uh, so the Bachs you're probably typically used to seeing are dark German lagers such as the Dunkelsbach or the Doppelbach. Uh, strong German beers in general are rarely pale. This is one of the only exceptions to that policy. So Maybach actually has a pretty interesting history. The Hofbrauhaus uh, in Munich is uh, arguably one of Germany's most famous, if not its most famous, brewery. Uh, and definitely more prolific. It, they export quite a bit of beer and it's all very good. But that, that brewery has been in place for a very long time and its history in the Bavarian region is pretty significant. So there is this town in Germany uh, that is nowhere near Bavaria called Einbeck. And uh, in Einbeck, uh, they were rather renowned for making very good local beer, which is, I think this is 15, 1600s. Uh, somebody knows better or cares to look it up, please correct me. Um, but there was a king of Germany at that time, or king of Bavaria, I think, uh, who wanted to bring a experienced Einbeck brewer down to the Hofbrauhaus and make him ha a beer that he enjoyed. Uh, so they recruited this dude from Einbeck and he came down to Munich and brewed a beer uh, which was initially known as the Einbecker. Uh, but really it is the first Maybach. Alright, so unfortunately the original Einbecker beer uh, has been pretty much lost to time, uh, but we could probably assume that the Hofbrauhaus Maybach is not too dissimilar. Uh, and most Maybachs in general aren't because they actually are very, very uh, simple, in, as most German beers are, in their construction. Uh, you'll also see these occasionally referenced as Helles Bach, which is basically a German translation of bright strong. Uh, so hell is meaning bright. If you ever had a Helles Lager, it's a bright pale lager. Uh, but a Helles Bach is a pale strong lager. If you're in the United States and you're looking for an example that is not imported, look at Rogue Dead Guy Ale. That is actually a Maybach. Um, even though it's called an ale. All right, so it's May 2020, uh, and I think a lot of us find ourselves with a little more time on our hands than we're used to. So this might be the perfect opportunity for some of us to try decoction mashing. Uh, I used this technique with great success in my last German lager, the Strong Doppelbach that I brewed uh, not too long ago. I'm gonna put that up here in the corner if you wanna check out the video for that. I'm not going to go as in-depth into decoction mashing in this video as I did in that video. So uh, if you want like a full-on tutorial of how to do it, check that video out. Um, but like I said, I have time on my hands so I might as well do it. Uh, I do think that in certain styles it adds quite a bit of character and in some styles it's not really that helpful. Um, but my really, my personal belief is that I think if you can do it and you want to do it and you find it exciting and educational, then I'll, by all means do it, but it's not necessary to brew this beer. So instead of doing a full-on double decoction like I did for the Doppelbach, we're just going to do a single decoction. Uh, that's going to cut down on the workload a little bit. Uh, probably not the amount of time since I'm still incorporating the single decoction into a step mash otherwise. Uh, so it is a rather advanced mash, but I want to stress that you don't need to do a decoction or really even a step mash to succeed with this beer. Um, I would recommend adding a portion of melanoidin malt uh, into your grain bill, probably like 5 to 8% uh, melanoidin malt, 
to replicate those decoction flavors. And then if you mash this at uh, probably like 150 Fahrenheit, I think that's what, 65 Celsius, you're gonna have great results by doing that. Uh, also, you can do the same thing with adding melanoid malt and just do a standard step mash by raising it to different temperature steps, either through adding hot water or adding direct heat. Uh, you don't need to do decoction mashes to have a successful brew day with German beer, but I do think it does add a little bit of character to it that you otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, and it's it's a lot of fun. I enjoy them. Yeah, so let's jump into the recipe here. So I'm uh, It's actually really simple in terms of ingredients. Uh, there's only two grains Pilsner malt and Munich malt It is two-thirds Pilsner one-thirds Munich. That's 12 pounds of Pilsner and six pounds of Munich malt uh, It should give us a pretty pale beer uh, and hopefully a little bit of orange color from the Munich for hops, um, and this is a 90 minute boil, I'm gonna do a 60 minute edition of Magnum to bitter, and I'm doing a 10 minute edition of Spaltz. That 10 minute edition is very optional. You usually don't do late boil editions in most German lagers. Spaltz is a very low alpha hop. Um, it's going to be a very subtle edition if it comes through, and I think it'll balance things out nicely. For yeast, uh, I'm actually gonna be moving into dry yeast territory. So I've actually had really good results using Saf Lager 3470 dry lager yeast. Um, and that is actually a pretty solid fermenter so uh, even though I have a ton of yeast cells in a single dry yeast packet I'm going to go overboard I'm going to pitch two dry yeast packets because we're looking for an expected original gravity of around 1079 and the rule of thumb is you want to pitch twice as much yeast as usual if you're brewing a lager to start with and if you're brewing a strong lager you want to basically pitch four times as much yeast as you normally would. So uh, that is the rule, that is the logic and reasoning behind putting two packets of dry yeast in there. For water, I'm using the similar water profile to my Doppelbach. Uh, that did really good with the Doppelbach, so I'm assuming it's gonna do very well with the Maybach as well. And that is 82 parts per million of calcium, 24 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 81 parts per million of sulfate, 181 parts per million of chloride, and 79 parts per million of carbonate. Um, and if you're worrying about this stuff and you don't know much about water, check out this video that's gonna pop up in the corner. It's gonna kind of go through, I did it a couple years ago and it's gonna kind of go through the basics of water chemistry with you. I wanna stress that if you're trying to brew this beer and you're using the water profile, uh, don't exactly copy my water profile unless you literally live next door to me because it's going to be different no matter where you are and I have very high ion counts for most parts because I'm using city water. If you're using RO water, I would suggest just looking up a different water profile. Um, you want to make sure that your calcium and carbonate levels are rather high um, as well as having a strong chloride to sulfate ratio, probably around two to one just to bring out that maltiness. Uh, I am adding eight grams of Epsom, seven grams of calcium chloride and three grams of chalk to 11 gallons of water uh, to get ready for this and that includes both mash and sparge water. Uh, I'm also adding a Camden tablet, which is going to get rid of chlorine and chloramine from the city water supply, both of which are very bad flavors for your beer. All right, so the mash is probably the most interesting part about this beer. Um, it's a single decoction. I have gone over double decoctions before, but what I'm going to do is basically take a four-step mash, so protein rest, maltose rest, dextrinization rest, and mash out and I'm gonna substitute the rise portion on one of those steps for a single decoction. So um, I'm gonna do it between the maltose rest and the dextrinization rest. Um, and we'll pull out a certain amount of the mash and boil it. So we're gonna start with a 15 minute, 133 Fahrenheit protein rest. Uh, so this is going to hopefully build up a very strong and luxurious head on the beer. I know that this is a little bit of a moot point if you're not using under modified malt. Uh, I am aware of that, but um, I don't really care. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a 15 minute protein rest anyway, because it makes me feel like I'm being authentic. And uh, then I'm gonna add heat to that uh, through my recirculating system to bring us up to 145 Fahrenheit for the maltose rest. And we're gonna hold that for a full 90 minutes. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and decoct uh, about 10 quarts of the mash. Because it is a single decoction, I don't really have to worry about measuring the amount of decoction that much because I'm just gonna add it back in until I reach that temperature. Um, and we're not pulling the grain out again after that. So 45 minutes into the maltose rest is when I'm gonna pull that decoction. We're gonna bring it up to a boil and we're gonna boil it for 30 minutes, constantly stirring it, and then add it back into the mash 
once uh, that time step is completed. And that'll raise us up to 158 Fahrenheit for the dextrinization rest. All right, and that's for 60 minutes. Once the dextrinization rest is complete, we'll do a mash out, and that's going to be at 168 Fahrenheit, and that will be for 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll collect wort and begin a batch sparge after that. So maltose rest is going to activate an enzyme that extracts a very highly fermentable sugar from the grain, and that is going to increase the fermentability of the wort. Um, however, with such a low temperature, it is going to require a longer amount of time in the mash tun, so that's why it's 90 minutes. The dextrinization rest activates a different enzyme that creates long chains of sugars which are partially unfermentable. That adds a little bit of sweetness and body to the beer and raises that finishing gravity. And that's for 60 minutes because it's going to be a higher temperature on the end of that spectrum. We're ensuring that we're denaturing pretty much all of the enzyme that is responsible for creating um, the fermentable sugars. And that was in that step beforehand. Mash out is a high temperature that is going to denature all those enzymes and stop the starch conversion process completely. Uh, and that's also going to ensure that we have a good laudering process. Uh, this is probably going to be a full day affair, probably about a three hour mash. Uh, so if you're trying to do this, just be aware of that. Uh, I have gotten my water heated up to temp and I've added all those salts earlier along with that Camden tablet. So I think we're ready to mash in. So let's go ahead and head over there once I pour myself some more coffee. All right, so our 15 minute protein rest has completed. So now it's time to start the second rest, which is at 145 Fahrenheit. That's gonna raise the mash up to 10 through direct heat um, through the recirculation system that I use. If you don't have one of those, you can always use a uh, boiling water addition measured out or direct heat underneath the mash tun if you keep a good stir going and uh, should be able to make that work. Okay, so uh, it's time to start our decoction now. So we're about 45 minutes into the uh, second temperature step. And um, so I'm just gonna pause the uh, recirculation system here for a minute. We're gonna scoop out our decoction and uh, start heating that up. Now, usually with the decoction, uh, you wanna pull from the thickest part of the mash if possible. And uh, this one quart dipper really does help out quite a bit. Well, we're gonna go ahead and fill up about 10 quarts of thick mash, I think. So you want your decoction consistency to be similar to this, a little bit of liquid on top, but pretty much 95% grain or thick mash. And so basically now, uh, what we're gonna do is keep a thermometer in there so we can keep an eye on how uh, close it is to boiling as it continues to heat up. And we're just gonna stir it very gently, just gradually just scrape it off the bottom uh, to prevent it from scorching as it heats up. And once it reaches a boil, we'll boil it for 30 minutes in doing the same thing, just consistently scraping it and uh, stirring it and keeping it from scorching. All right, so we've been boiling this for about 30 minutes on kind of a medium high heat. Uh, not a lot of heat, just enough to keep it boiling and not from uh, scorching the bottom. Been stirring it the whole time. And as you can see, the Maillard reactions have really done their job because this is now like a very different shade of brown. Uh, lots of nice, good, rich flavors hopefully gonna be coming out of this. So what we're gonna do now is uh, start adding it back into the mash tun gradually. So I shut off the heat, first of all, so I don't scorch it while I'm not paying attention to it. And we'll bring it over here and start uh, scooping it back in. So now we are targeting a new step temperature of 158 Fahrenheit. So what we wanna do is actually add this very gradually. So probably about two scoops at a time. Then we'll stir it up and check the temperature to make sure we don't overshoot. And remember, because it's a thick mash, it's gonna take a minute for that temperature to come around. All 
All right, so our temperature in the main mash tun here is actually up to 158 right now. So it took about, I think, eight or nine scoops. Uh, so we're gonna let this cool off now down to back around the sacrification rest temperature. And once it is cooled off, we'll add the rest of it back in just to make sure we maximize that flavor contribution. Uh, but now we're gonna hold our uh, mash at the next temperature, which is 158 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. All right, so we're now at the end of our uh, dextrinization rest. So uh, we're gonna get ready to mash out, which is just a simple 10 degree raising of the temperature here. So once it gets up to that temp, we'll hold it there for 15 minutes and uh, we will then begin the laudering process. All right, so uh, we now have uh, completed the mash after a long time, of course. So uh, now it's time to start collecting the wort. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, transfer the wort from this mash tun into this kettle here. And then we're gonna go ahead and start sparging with the water that we have uh, set aside for that. And uh, we'll let that sit in the mash for another 15, 20 minutes and uh, collect second runnings. Hopefully we only need to do this one time, uh, but sometimes with these big strong beers, it does require a, uh, a second sparge and a third runnings, but we will see. So let's get to it. Okay, so we have a pre-boil original gravity that is looking like it's about 15.5 bricks, uh, which is actually very high. <laughs> it's uh, 1062 OG. Uh, that's what that translates to. So um, we have a potentially very strong beer on our hands here. All right, so we've just reached the boil for the uh, Maybach here. And uh, actually the first hop edition is not until uh, about 30 minutes from now, so we're gonna wait for a first half hour and before we add any hops. Uh, so I'll catch you then. Our boil has been going for about 30 minutes now, which means it's time to add our 60 minute bittering hop edition, which is the 0.7 ounces of Magnum. So that is gonna go in now. And now we will wait until 10 minutes are left in the boil before we do anything else. All right, so it's now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add my 10 minute hop edition right now, which is the one ounce of Spalt hops. Those are going in now. And then I'm going to add a Whirlflock tablet, as well as two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient. All right, so the other thing I'm gonna do around the 10 minute mark is uh, actually start to sanitize the inside of my chiller here. So assuming that your hardware is clean already, if you recirculate some uh, boiling wort through your chiller and your pump over the last 10 minutes of the boil, it will sanitize the inside of it. So that is what we were about to do. All right, so we're cooling down the wort now. So we're just gonna bring the wort down to like a decent ale temperature for pitching, probably like 65 to 70 degrees. And then I'm gonna transition it over into my Kaser um, where I keep the rest of my kegs for serving and it's gonna bring it down to about 45 degrees and then probably by like midnight tonight, I might be good to pitch the yeast. Um, but we're not pitching until about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna hold it at 45 degrees Fahrenheit for about seven to 10 days until we've reached about 50 to 70% attenuation. At that point, I will take it out of the keyser and bring it up to room temperature and hold it there for about three to five days for a diacetyl rest. Diacetyl is a natural chemical that is produced by yeasts and especially lager yeasts. Um, and lager yeast need a uh, room temperature step during the fermentation to clean that up and remove the, uh, the off flavor that that produces. The off flavor tastes a lot like butter. It's pretty nasty, especially in a lager like this. So what we wanna do is uh, give that the appropriate amount of time to clean itself up during the fermentation. So once fermentation has completed and we've hit our final gravity, I will keg this beer immediately. And then I will actually lager it in the keg for 
about a month, maybe more than a month. Um, this is going to be a very strong beer. I can tell it's probably already north of seven and a half percent. Um, I will get the gravity reading in a bit to figure out just how strong it could be, but it's it's probably going to be as strong as my Doppelbach. Uh, so it, it's going to need at least a month or two uh, just to completely lager out to get the flavors all balanced and to clarify completely. That'll take some time and that's okay. Uh, but hopefully it is uh, a good one. Uh, brew day has been pretty good so far, uh, just been very long. So it's a, obviously with a decoction mash, it takes a lot longer to do things, uh, but that's all right. It was a lot of fun. I did definitely enjoy this brew day quite a bit. All right, so everything has cooled down to about 70 degrees, uh, which is, yeah, it's fine for me to put it in the fermenter now. So like I said, I'm just gonna chill this uh, further later. We can just go ahead and start that transfer process now. Uh, and what I like to do is just aerate the crap out of this thing by splashing it into the fermenter. And uh, that will generate a lot of good bubbles. Uh, with a lager, you really do want a lot of aeration if you can manage it. Um, and this is about as best I can do without an oxygen wand right now. All right, so this is our original gravity, uh, which is about 19 bricks, and that equates to a whopping 1077 for OG. Um, <laughs> very strong lager potential here, and it's literally only two gravity points lower than the original gravity of my Doppelbach, which turned out to be about 8%. So uh, this should be quite the fun beer. Uh, it's just going to take a very long time to be ready. Okay, so uh, everything has cooled down quite nicely many, many hours later. Uh, so now it's time to go ahead and pitch the yeast, which has been sitting here rehydrated and waiting to go this whole time. All right, so the final gravity uh, has finally been hit. Uh, so a couple days in a row, we've been sitting at about 1018 here. So um, it's a bit high, but uh, I did mash this with a method that produced a lot of unfermentable sugars. So uh, it's not that surprising. It's actually very similar to the Doppelbach uh, in terms of how the fermentation went. but. Anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and cold crash this tonight, and then I'll keg it, and then we're going to start that extended lagering period for probably about a month. All right, so we actually ended up getting lucky with this lager because it actually took only two weeks to drop out clean. So it is a well-known fact that decoction mashing increases one's efficiency, uh, which is why we ended up with a very, very high ABV Maybach. This thing came in like right behind my Doppelbach in terms of strength, so uh, it's it's a big one. I have found this dry lager strain to be actually really awesome. Um, it's a robust fermenter, and it chewed through the majority of fermentation in about a week and a half at lager temps. Uh, so that's actually kind of fast for a lager. Anyway, we got to about 50 to 60% attenuation. Uh, so that was a gravity reading of about uh, 1030 or 1040. And I pulled it out of the keyser here and I let it stay at room temperature for about three days. That gives the lager yeast a chance to clean up the diacetyl that it produces during fermentation and uh, aids in a cleaner beer flavor at the end of the day. All in all, the fermentation process was about two and a half weeks, I think. And at that point we kegged and then we kept it in the keyser here for about another two and a half weeks. Um, it lagered out relatively fast, and the reason for that is because I do kind of use a little bit of an accelerated lagering method. I follow uh, the Brulosophy quick lagering method, which involves a, uh, a step where you basically cold crash the lager after you've finished the fermentation, uh, and then, once you transfer to the keg, you add a healthy dose of gelatin finings to help that yeast drop out over the course of a couple days. It kind of cuts down on the amount of time involved in the lagering process, and I've had really good results with it. I've used it for all of my lagers for about the last year. So that, in addition to really cold temperatures, does definitely aid in getting your beer to drop out bright. Uh, relatively fast. Now the flavor of this beer is going to mature a bit more over time uh, because it is a strong lager. It is going to have a little bit of a flavor kind of uh, evolution over time. But right now it is ready to drink. It is very good and I do want to talk about it. So we're going to do that. And I figured given the history of the Maybach that I would use my Hofbrau mug here uh, during the review portion of this video because uh, it just kind of seemed appropriate. All right, so it's called Damage Incorporated, um, and it comes in at 7.9% ABV and 26 IBUs. All right, so the color of the beer is kind of on the order of a dark, deep, rich gold color. 
Um, it is not quite copper, and it is not quite amber. Uh, really just more along the lines of gold, um, just with a quite a significant level of uh, darkness to it. Uh, completely clear, you can see absolutely right through this, it is bright, um, and it has a relatively uh, nice lacing on the surface. It's kind of like an off-white cream colored head. Uh, the head pours quite nicely, but it doesn't stick around forever. Uh, uh, it does leave a really nice long-lasting layer of bubbles on the surface. All right, so now we'll go into aroma. This thing smells so German. Uh, <laughs> there's just this sweet honey and rich Pilsner malt aroma. Um, yeah, it's got like this kind of honey-like character. Um, it smells straight out of a beer garden. Uh, a little bit of bread crust. Um, and just general bready character. But it's really kind of a sweet smelling aroma, uh, quite dominated by a honey-like characteristic. All right, we'll go for mouthfeel. The mouthfeel here is kind of on the medium to medium full-bodied level. Um, it is definitely not light-bodied. It's also a nearly 8% beer, so one would expect that to not be the case. Um, that's like a good, satisfying, you know, standard medium level of carbonation as well. Uh, it doesn't really get in the way. It adds a lot of nice character to the beer. Um, and it just feels right. It's clean, it's crisp, um, it has enough body to be satisfying without really overdoing it. Um, and even though this is an 8% beer, it doesn't really quite feel like it, but it's definitely not on the drinkability level of, say, a 4.5% session beer. Alright, so moving on to flavor now. Mm. I mean, this is without a doubt one of the best beers I have ever made. Um, I'm just going to put that out front right now. This is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> it is chewy, toasted caramel um, with a strong amount of bready backing, but not so much bread as, say, for example, a Munich Dunkel. It doesn't have that strong toasted molasses character of a Doppelbuck, and also doesn't have the crackery crispness of a Pilsner. It is somewhere in between the two of those things. And it is just a delicious, satisfying amount of just toasted caramel and breadiness. The other interesting thing about this is the yeast that I used did kick off um, a lot of diacetyl. Now, in German lagers, a certain amount of diacetyl is actually desirable. Um, even though we do perform that diacetyl rest to kind of control the levels of it during the fermentation, there's still a little bit left over at the end. And we want that because that what that provides is a really nice kind of buttery slickness uh, on the tongue that actually complements the malty character of this beer. What it ends up doing is creating a combination of mouthfeel and flavor in the beer that just absolutely sing together in a beautiful harmony. Um, there's also a very strong honey-like character that's coming from the Pilsner malt that I used, and that honey-like character in combination with the breadiness and, of course, with the caramel notes that you get from decoction mashing Munich malt, uh, really just makes this beer so phenomenal. This is, without a doubt, one of my best beers of all time. It's just absolutely the perfect combination of flavors and mouthfeel, and it just feels perfect. It looks beautiful in the glass. It feels... Uh, amazing on your palate and it tastes really good. Uh, the only issue with this beer is that it is indeed very strong um, and even for a Maybach uh, and it does kind of result in you know obviously having a little too much if you're not watching yourself so just be careful with it. So I am really having a hard time just finding something wrong with this beer. Um, I suppose if the if I really had to complain about one thing um, it would be the head retention. I do prefer a more fluffy head to come out. Um, it does, you know, it does pour quite vigorously and has a good head when it comes out, but it, it just kind of collapses quickly. Um, and the only thing that's left is just this layer on the glass uh, or on the surface of the beer. But um, I really would prefer for it to have a lot more robustness in the head, but that's all right. Um, I'm definitely willing to accept that. I mean, as far as flavor goes though, I, I don't think I could have done it any better. 
I know like a while ago I mentioned something uh, in either my alt beer or my Doppelbach video about the beer that I had just brewed at that time was probably the most quote authentically German tasting beer that I would ever made, um, which was true at that time. But this has far and away supplanted any of those beers as being the most authentically German tasting one I have made to date. It really does seem like this is something I might have ordered from the Hofbrauhaus or my local German beer garden. Like it's, it's really just, it tastes authentic. It really just tastes bang on. Um, and I'm really very satisfied with the way it came out. So I am not very far from the end of this beer and you are not very far from the end of this video. So I appreciate you watching all the way to the end. Um, I just have a couple things to say here. First of all, if you enjoy the content, hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff. Um, this is the standard kind of video that I put out. I will make a beer, just catalog the whole process all the way through and give you a tasting at the end all in one video. It's called Grain to Glass. That's what I do for the most part. But also, please feel free to comment down below if you have any thoughts, questions, concerns, or any sort of information you want to share about this beer uh, in the comment section. I read every single comment and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. You guys as a community put forth some awesome ideas and some really good feedback overall and I've really enjoyed all of the feedback you guys have given me um, over the course of my uh, time being on YouTube as a home brewer. Now I'm sure some of you are wondering where to find the recipe for this beer and that is going to be in the description box down below. You will find a complete recipe there in the way that I brewed it. If you want to do a single infusion mash for the beer, you're going to do fine at 152 degrees and just I would recommend adding in a portion, maybe 5 to 8% melanoid and malt to replicate the flavors that I produced during the decoction mash. Um, you can also do a step mash in the same temperature steps and times that I used. I also recommend adding in that same portion of melanoid and malt if you wish to do do that. In the description box, you're also going to find a complete list of all the home brewing equipment that I use right now uh, to make beer with. And, and if you happen to be in the market for some brewing equipment, um, there are links to Amazon where you can purchase it for yourself if you wish to. Just be advised that if you do click on one of those links and you end up purchasing something, I earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you. And it does go back into supporting this channel monetarily, and it means a lot to me. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this surprisingly excellent beer. And uh, I will catch you guys in the next one. Until then, cheers.